just present with Mr. DeGarren and Mr. Chesnoff, Mr. Henderson, Mr. Bailey, and Mr. Lewin are present. I'm sure Mr. Miata can't be far. You may resume your questioning, Mr. Lewin. Mr. Durst, you heard your brother Douglas's testimony when he testified that you did not show up to the closing that day. Do you recall that testimony? No. Uh -oh. <laughs> Do you recall that testimony? No. Is it your position that you have a clear memory that you were definitely at that closing that day, or is it a situation where you're saying, I think I was there, but I don't really know? I remember, I have a clear memory of going to the closing. But you do agree that the closing had to be put over. It did not happen that day, correct? I recall that, yes. Now, you told Detective Strzok on February 8, 1982, that you left work at the Durst organization in Manhattan between 4.30 and 5 and went to the penthouse on Riverside Drive. Is that correct? That's correct. And you have further stated that when you got there to the penthouse, it appeared to you that Kathy had been there because there was a Coke bottle on the table, little things appeared to have been moved around, and the New York Times had been brought into the apartment. Is that correct? There was a Coke bottle on the table, and an ashtray on the table with a cigarette butt in it. Mr. Durst, isn't it true that you never mentioned anything to Detective Strzok about a cigarette? I don't remember whether I told Detective Strzok about the Coke bottle yesterday. So I want you to assume for a moment, Mr. Durst, that you did tell Detective Strzok about the Coke bottle on the table, but you never mentioned to him about a cigarette. Would you be able to explain, if you did not tell him, why you didn't tell him? why I told him about the Coke bottle, but not about the ashtray and the cigarette. No, I'm just asking about the cigarette. Would you be able to explain why you wouldn't have mentioned the cigarette? As far as I know, I told Detective Stroke about the Coke bottle and the cigarette. So I want you to assume for a moment, Mr. Durst, that there is no mention in Detective Strzok's testimony or in any of the evidence that's been presented in this case of you telling him that, in fact, you had seen a cigarette. I'm just asking, if that's correct, can you explain why you didn't tell him about the cigarette? I guess I did not get to it. In addition, Mr. Durst, isn't it true that you later told Mary Hughes, Kathy's sister, that it was a coffee pot that you had seen inside the apartment and not a Coke bottle? No. So are you denying that you ever said that to Mary Hughes? Yes. I want to talk about Tuesday, February 2nd. You told Detective Strzok during your interview with him on February 8, 1982, that at around noon, you drove to Stanford, Connecticut to look for land parcels for the Durst organization, correct? I told him that I went to Connecticut to look at land, but not for the Durst organization. So I want you to assume, Mr. Durst, and in fact, Detective Strzok has testified to this, that you said you drove to Stanford, Connecticut to look for land parcels for the Durst organization. Can you explain why you would have told him that? You want me to assume something that I don't recall telling him? 
Yes, because the, the evidence in this case is that's what Detective Strzok has testified to. So I'm asking you that if you told Detective Strzok, as he has testified to, that you said you were looking at land parcels for the Durst Organization in Stanford, Connecticut, can you explain that? I might have told Detective Strzok that I was looking at land in Stanford. I did not tell Detective Strzok that I was looking at land for the Durst Organization. So you would agree that if you were up in Stanford, Connecticut, looking at land, that would not have been anything related to your job, is that correct? Correct. You also told Detective Strzok that you called the office about business while you were up in Connecticut, correct? Don't remember telling him that. I want you to assume that you told Detective Strzok that you called the office about business. Do you understand what I'm asking you to assume right now? I want you to assume that. Do you understand? I don't know if I called the office or not. No, so that's what, listen to me. I want you to assume that you previously said that you called the office from Connecticut. I'm asking you to assume that. Do you understand that? You're going to assume that for the purposes of this question. Do you understand? You want me to assume I call the office from Connecticut, and I understand that. So Okay, so I'm, I'm actually I'm not actually asking you to assume you called the office. I'm asking you to assume that you said you called the office. Do you understand that? I'll assume that. And you have previously related that you only called the office collect. Do you recall having said that? Well, that's not true. Well, Mr. Durst, isn't it true, and I'll give you the, the quote, you have said, the quote is something like this, of course I called the office, co call the office collect. The only reason I'm calling the office is because Seymour wants me to call the office, and I'm going to call collect. You don't recall saying that, Mr. Durst? I recall Andrew asking me to say that. Oh, okay, so you're not saying you didn't say it. This is another one of those things where Andrew told you to say it, and then you said it. Is that correct? Correct. And are you aware, Mr. Durst, that the only collect calls that day to the Durst organization were from a Mount Kisco, New York tire shop at 917, AM, which Douglas has said he made in his testimony, and calls from Burnigate and Shipbottom, New Jersey throughout the day. Are you aware of that from the phone records? I repeatedly call the office, not collect. I don't remember Douglas saying that the correct calls were from ship bottom. So, Mr. Durst, we've had testimony. I can put the document up for you if you would like that shows the phone calls for that day. And that document, which is a part of the evidence in this case, only shows collect calls to the Durst organization on February 2nd from Mount Kisco, New York at 917 and from Burnigate and Shipbottom, New Jersey throughout the day. You are aware that's what those records show, correct? I am not aware of what the record shows. B, when you have it, Tim, can you guys just no, let me know? Pull 72, page 21. Okay. Pull 72? Yes. I'm sorry, what are you? Pull 72, it's page 21 of 30. I want you to four, no. look at, when you look at item 5, item 4, excuse me, 202, 917 AM, Mount Kisco, New York, collect. Do you see that? I see that. You agree that Douglas Durst testified that he made that call from the tire shop, correct? That he I did not make that call. 
listen to my question. You heard your brother Douglas say, I made that call at 917 from the tire shop. You heard that testimony, correct? Well, maybe Douglas Durst made that call, but I did not make that call. <laughs> listen to my question, Mr. Durst. Your brother testified he made the call from Mount Kisco, New York. You heard that testimony, correct? No, that's not correct. Okay, I want you to assume that your brother testified to that. Your brother also testified that he did not make any of the following four calls, and those are all from Beach Haven, New Jersey and Barnegat, New Jersey, between 12, 19 a.m. and 4.55 p.m. Do you recall him testifying that he did not make those calls? I am testifying that I did not make any calls from New Jersey. If you had made the calls from New Jersey, Mr. Durst, would you tell us? Yes. Would you agree, Mr. Durst, that if you had made those calls from New Jersey, that with the testimony that those calls are adjacent to the Pine Barrens, that that would be incriminating information regarding what you might have done with your missing wife's body? Overruled. If I had made calls that I did not make, it would be incriminating. Okay. So, so Mr. Durst, so what you're saying is you agree that the calls are incriminating, but you're telling this jury in essence, hey, listen, if I made them jury, I would tell you because I'm not going to lie? Is that what your testimony is? My testimony is that if I had made those calls, I would say I had made those calls. Even though you previously have testified, Mr. Durst, that you will lie, you will commit perjury to avoid saying damaging things that hurt your case. That's your previous testimony, correct? I previously testified and I both would and would not answer hypothetical questions. If I had made those calls, I would tell you I did not make those calls. And Mr. Durst, you've also previously said when I've asked you, given your statements, how is the jury supposed to know when you're lying and not lying, and you responded, I don't know. Do you recall that? I do recall that, but what I sort of figured out is that jurors are not supposed to talk to one another or talk to others about being jurors, and that seemingly there are no courses that jurors can take telling them how to be jurors. So jurors are on their own to figure out how to be jurors. Would you agree, Mr. Durst, that if your response is that basically you yourself cannot even explain how to tell when you're lying and when you're not, can you explain how's a jury supposed to do it? They are supposed to use their intuition and make decisions. So you would agree that at the time Kathy was disappeared in 1982, you knew what the Pine Barrens was, correct? I know where the Pine Barrens are, correct. And you knew at the time that the Pine Barrens was a huge hundreds of thousands of acres of location that had a sand soil that did not freeze in the winter, correct? I have no knowledge of when sand soil freezes. Well, did you hear the testimony in this case? There was testimony by uh, witnesses, I believe it was Detective Becerra, who related that the Pine Barrens is an infamous mafia burial ground because in the winter, because of its sand composition, it doesn't freeze and you can dig it up. Do you hear that testimony? I remember Joey Becerra testifying that he went out to the Pine Barrens and drove around 
and found lots of places where someone could dispose of a body. Would you agree, Mr. Durst, that you are now aware that the Pine Barrens basically has a sand surface and that it would be a good place to dispose of a body during the winter time if everything else was frozen. Would you agree? I would agree that Joey Becerra said that. Do you disagree with that factual statement? Oh, I have no knowledge. All right, let's talk about February 3rd, Wednesday. What did you do on Wednesday, February 3rd? Wednesday. What's that? I looked at houses in Greenwich, Connecticut, and in New Canaan, Connecticut, and I worked on the MS DOS, Microsoft operating statement. Mr. Durst, isn't it true that you never mentioned to Detective Strzok that on Wednesday you were looking at houses at all, but instead said that you went up to Danbury, Connecticut that day and met with the Waterworks contracts guy. Isn't that what you told him? What my screen says is that I did not tell Detective Stroke that I went to Connecticut that day and met with the and met with the water work contract guy. Okay, let me, let me just repeat the question, maybe it'll be easier. Isn't it true that you told Detective Strzok that you met with the Waterworks contracts guy in Danbury, Connecticut that day? I cannot imagine telling Detective Stroke that I met with a water works contracts guy. I have no idea what the water works contract guy is. Did you further tell Detective Strzok that you met, quote, a guy at the water works showroom to do the bathrooms at 37 Riverside Drive? I don't know. Does that refresh your memory? No, I don't know what the waterworks guy refers to. So you don't, when I say waterworks, you don't know that to be a showroom design type place in Danbury, Connecticut? Please put up LADA 087988. This is going to be, Mr. Durst, Detective Strzok testified about this during his testimony. This was marked as people 57E, page 9. 57E, 9. Page 9. This is what it says for February 3rd. Picked up dog at kennel. Went to Ridgefield for lunch. Noon touchstone. Then drove to Danbury, Connecticut, met with Guy Waterworks Contracts to do bathrooms at 37 Riverside Drive. Does that refresh your recollection, Mr. Durst? I remember picking up the dog. I remember going to lunch in Ridgefield. I do not remember going to Danbury. I do not remember doing anything about any bathroom at Riverside Drive. You agree, though, that these are Detective Strzok's notes and that that's what he testified to, is that correct? I will accept that these are his notes. He did a bad job of taking notes. Well, when you say did a bad job of taking notes, meaning he just made that up? How he came up with that, I have no idea. Do you agree that, by the way, did you go up to, were you in Danbury, Connecticut that day? Yeah. 
I was not in Danbury, Connecticut on February 3rd. Did you go to New York City that day, February 3rd? Late in the afternoon. Isn't it true that you told Detective Strzok that you never went to New York City that day? No. Can you put it back up? Sorry, Tim. I want you to read it, Mr. Durris. I want you to tell me where it says that you went to New York City. Maybe I missed it. Let me know when you're done with page with this page, and I'll move it to the next one. I can't read that page. Okay, let me try to read it for you then. I'll, I'll uh, continue where I was after the bathrooms at Riverside Drive sentence. Arrive back at South Salem, 5 to 5.30. Sees Bill and Ruth Mayer made rice for dinner, called her about 37 Riverside Drive about 8 p.m., it says 2,000 hours, left message, no return call, call his father and Joan Refson, Susan Berman, you give a number, and Doug, Doug Oliver regarding theater tickets, crimes of the heart, Joanne got tickets, that's the end of page seven goes to the next page and it's Thursday 2-4 can you tell me where went to bed at 10 p.m. where did you indicate that you went to New York City at all that day does not say I went to New York City. It is wrong. So Mr. Durst, you literally know, you literally told him that you made rice for dinner. Do you think what you made for dinner was a relevant, important point to make? It was probably more relevant than going to Caldor's. He was the master. I answer his question. So, so, Mr. Durst, so would you agree that the fact that you didn't mention New York City, by the way, let me just back up. Do you want me to, I can go, the jury's heard the testimony, but you want me to actually put up the notes to show for the other two days that you did not mention shopping for houses in Connecticut or New York and that you never mentioned anything about Caldor? Do you want me to actually have that up there, or will you concede that you never mentioned anything about either of those two things to Detective Strzok? I'm just trying to save some time. I think I did tell Detective Strzok that I was looking at houses on February 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. All right, can, can I we... I did not tell Detective Strzok I went to Caldor's and made a purchase. Can you put up February 2nd, Tim? I think it's going to be 6. Okay, I'm going to read this to you. Is Two page 6 of the same exhibit? Yes, Your Honor. Page 8, Your Honor. This is 8? This is 6. It's confusing. The first two pages are a scan of the front and back cover of the I see. Tuesday, February 2nd, 82, leaves about noon and goes to Ridgefield, Connecticut, stopping at Georgetown, Connecticut Post Office. Had breakfast, drove... Okay, sure. Ridgefield, I think. You said Ridgefield, sorry. Go ahead. Leaves about noon and goes to Ridgefield, Connecticut, stopping at Georgetown, Connecticut Post Office. Had breakfast and drove to Stanford, Connecticut. Drove around looking at locations of land parcel, land parcels, called office regarding uh, business. You recall saying you were up in Stanford, Connecticut, is that correct? Well, Stanford, Connecticut 
is between Greenwich and New Canaan. To get from Greenwich to South Salem, you go through Stanford, Connecticut. Mr. Same Dur thing with New Canaan. Mr. Durst, you just mentioned a moment ago that, that you never said you were in Stanford, Connecticut on Tuesday. Are you now saying you recall that, yes, you were in Stanford, Connecticut? To get to Greenwich, Connecticut, from South Salem, you drive through Stanford. Motion to strike is non-responsive. Okay. Mr. Durst, are you now admitting that, in fact, you were in Stanford, Connecticut on Tuesday, February 2nd? I never denied that I was in Stanford. Let's go to February 3rd, please. The next day, 7. And are you still denying, Mr. Durst, that you, on February 3rd, that you were in Danbury, Connecticut? Did not go to Danbury, Connecticut. On February 3rd. On February 3rd, Mr. Durst, isn't it true that you bought a pair of boots that day in Manhattan? Well, that's what I've been saying. That I went to New York City. Well, Mr. Durst, you're aware that you have to say you went to New York City because you know I've got the evidence of you buying the boots. So you're saying you went to New York City now. But that's not what you told Detective Strzok, is it? I told Detective Strzok that I went to the office Wednesday in the afternoon. I might not have told him that I bought a pair of cowboy boots. And, but you agree there's nothing in his notes that reflects that you told him that and nothing in his testimony that says you told him that, correct? I, I, will agree, I will accept that there's nothing in his notes that says I went to New York City. Will you accept there was nothing in his testimony as well that said you went to New York City on that date? Yes. All right. Now, please put up 150370 and 150371. These are going to be their boot receipts, Mr. Durst. Is no. it a number? Next in order is going to be 309. 309. 309. Mr. while these are coming up, you would agree that as a part of discovery in this case, we furnished you with these receipts, which I'm going to show you for the boots, correct? I never denied that I bought boots. That's not my question, Mr. Durst. You were given, as a part of discovery in this case, the evidence that you had bought these boots, the receipts, correct? You were given those in discovery. Is that true? I do not deny that we were given the evidence you say we were given. And for that reason, Mr. Durst, you would agree that you can't come up here and say, well, I wasn't in New York that day, because the receipts demonstrate that you were, correct? I never said I was not in New York that day. That was not my question, Mr. Durst. Do you agree that given that we have the receipts, you don't have a choice but to say you were in New York that day? I have no reason not to say I was in New York that day. Well, if that's true, Mr. Durst, then how come you didn't tell Detective Strzok you were in New York? I am not sure I did not tell Detective Strzok that I was in New York Wednesday afternoon. You just agreed, literally one minute ago, Mr. Durst, you just agreed that you will accept that you did not tell 
that there is no evidence that you told Detective Strzok you were in New York and that it's not in his notes. That's what you just agreed to. Now you're saying, no, I did tell him. Which is it? And I don't need the receipts anymore. You asked me a question. I have no knowledge of not telling Detective Stroke that I went to New York City. Okay, why did Whether you buy... I told him I bought a pair of cowboy boots or not, I don't remember. Why did you buy boots that day? Because my... Because I felt like it. Did it in somehow involve needing to change shoes because you had disposed of your wife's body? I did not. We have to go back to the beginning. First, on Wednesday, as far as I was concerned, my wife was happily going about her life. Mr. Durst, at 7.05 p.m. on February 3rd, you made a six-minute call to Doug Oliver. Is that correct? I certainly do not deny it. And the question would be, you made a second, excuse me, six-minute call to Doug Oliver at 8.47 p.m. that night. I assume you're not going to deny that either, correct? I don't remember making the calls. I don't deny I made the calls. And let me ask something. What were you talking to Doug Oliver about? Well, at some point, well, we're talking about Wednesday. By 8.47, I was getting worried about Kathy because I got a message on the answering machine at Riverside Drive, that Kathy had not been wherever she was supposed to be on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, and that Kathy should promptly call the number that they gave. So you were calling Doug Oliver to discuss with him that you couldn't find Kathy? talk to Doug Oliver about. Well, would you agree, Mr. Durst, that if you just found out that your wife is missing and hasn't been seen in three days, that you're not going to be calling Doug Oliver to talk about theater tickets or um, sports or museums, etc. You're going to be preoccupied with where is my missing wife. Is that a fair statement? Wednesday, early in the evening, when I took the message from the answering machine, I was still thinking. I was not thinking that Kathy was missing, just that Kathy had missed something she should have been doing at Albert Einstein. Well, the call you got, you're saying, Mr. Durst, and you got it before 7.05 p.m., correct? It was on your machine, correct? And you heard it before 7.05 p.m., is that correct? I got the message on the answering machine after 5 p.m. because when I called back the number, I got a recording that the office was open from 9 to 5 and that I would have to call back in the morning. Right, so you were concerned enough when you got that message to immediately try and call back, correct? Correct? When I got the message, it was after 5 p.m. And after calling back, I got, another, I got a machine that said 
the office is open from 9 to 5, you have to call back. Right, but you were concerned enough, Mr. Durst, when you got the message to immediately try and call back, correct? You weren't successful, but you tried to call back. Is that correct? Yeah. And after that, you called Doug Oliver at 705 and then at 847. Is that correct? I accept that I did that. So the question would be, Mr. Durst, certainly if you were calling Doug Oliver, it would have been to discuss the fact that you don't know where your wife is, right? I talked to Doug Oliver about lots of things. At that time, I don't think I was worried about Kathy. All I knew was that she had missed whatever she was supposed to do on Monday and Tuesday. Well, Mr. Durst, given that your wife was in medical school and given that she was doing a rotation and they're saying they have not heard anything from her in two days and you're concerned enough to call back immediately to try to reach them, wouldn't you agree that you would have almost certainly said something about that to your close friend, Doug Oliver? No. You also called Susan Berman that night. Do you remember the purpose? That was at 8.53. What was the purpose of that call? I don't have purposes, or I did not have purposes, whenever I telephoned a friend. Mr. Durst, let's talk about February 4th. On February 5th, when you talked to Detective Strzok, you told him you did not become concerned about Kathy until February 4th. Is that right? That is right. And you said you were not concerned before that date because Kathy was spending the night at the hospital, correct? That's what you told Detective Strzok. I did not tell Detective Strzok that Kathy was spending the night at the hospital. Can we put up the February 4th notes? I don't know if I'm they're in... I'm not finished with my answer. Oh, I apologize. I did tell Detective Stroke that many times Kathy had different when she was doing her sub-internship would be required to stay overnight at the hospital. And many times Kathy would stay over with friends at Albert Einstein's dormitory. Tuesday, February 4th, about 5 p.m., leaves Mercedes at South Salem, something 35, bus station. I just lost where it was. This is reading from the Santa Yes. Area. To North White Plains Railroad Station to Grand Central and arrived about 8 p.m. at office. Busy at office most of the day. Meeting uptown at 3 p.m. in 60s and came right here at 4 p.m. Machine had a lot of messages from many people all week. Dr. Cook, cousin, Charlie, etc. They got worried, called several people, hospital from here, 37 Riverside Drive. Then went to office and called her sister, not home. Also, it's the end of the page. Called Susan Berman. He then arrived at South Salem, got called from Dr. Cook about 8.30 p.m. He then called sister, mother, Gilberta, etc. Thursday night, called 20th Precinct, uh, asked questions, etc. Told him to come next day and see detectives. Thursday goes to bed. Mr. Durst, you're aware that Detective Strzok testified that you told him when he interviewed you that, in fact, you believe that Kathy was staying overnight at the hospital, and that is why you were not worried. Is that correct? I told him she might have stayed over night at the hospital. 
you, she might have stayed over in the dorm. I might have told her that she might have stayed with her boyfriend. So you agree, though, that when you got the call from the rotation, from the, from the uh, individuals at the medical school and the hospital, that you were well aware that Kathy was not staying over at the hospital. Is that correct? The call from the medical school was on the answering machine when I got home, when I got back to Riverside Drive Wednesday evening. And that call told you, Mr. Durst, you now are aware that Kathy was not staying in the hospital because no one knew where she was, correct? Correct. So is that the information that finally led you to be concerned? Is that correct? When I finally decided that I should be worried, it wasn't until Thursday evening, February the 4th. And I think the first thing I did was to call the precinct and ask, how do I go about reporting a missing person? Mr. Durst, isn't it true that you called the precinct to report Kathy missing before you called her family members to find out if they had heard from her? I called the precinct to find out how to report a missing person. But Mr. Durst, wouldn't the first thing you would do before you call the police, wouldn't the first thing you would do is you would call Kathy's family, her mom, her sisters, her brother, and find out, hey, listen, has anybody seen Kathy? Isn't that what a normal person does? Well, I'm not a normal person. I am told that I'm somewhere on the autistic spectrum. I don't know what a normal person okay. does. It seemed to me what I wanted to do was find out how to report a missing person. And then... M motion to strike the everything about him being on the autistic spectrum. Overruled. You asked him about a normal person. He oh. explained it's not. So, Mr. Durst, let me ask you. So, was it your intention, whenever you could, to try to throw out that I've got autism thing whenever you had a chance? Did that just organically come up in your answer? Or was that an intentional move on your part to try and make the argument to this jury that somehow you're going to blame a condition that millions of people suffer with to explain your behavior? Is that what you're doing? And I'm, and I'm asking questions to follow up what he answered, right. Your Honor. Right. Just a moment. Um, overall, you asked me what a normal person does. I am told I am autistic and not normal, and I don't know what a normal person does. I know what I did. I know my intention. And I called up Kathy's family to try to find out if they knew where Kathy was and to tell Kathy that what she was doing I was taking very seriously and that if I had not heard from her by Friday afternoon, I was going to go to the police and report her as missing. Mr. Durst, wouldn't the first thing that you would do before you called the police at all 
would be to call Kathy's family and find out, hey, listen, have you guys heard from her? Do you know where she is? Isn't that the first thing that anybody would do, whether they allegedly had autism or Asperger's, etc.? I don't know. Kathy's missing, gone missing, was the first experience I had with knowing someone who was missing. By the way, you've talked about your autism and your Asperger's. Do you recall, Mr. Durst, what your response was when I brought it up during the interview? Do you recall either using the word yourself or agreeing with my characterization of the Asperger's defense as complete bullshit? I don't think I agree to that. I do think. Yeah, let's run that, please. Okay. I do think. Can he finish your without the interruption? Oh, I didn't realize. I thought he was yeah. done. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Mr. Durst. Please finish. Do you have more to say or were you done? I do think that I said in your presence, while I was hoping to make a plea bargain, that Asperger's is no longer considered a definitive disease, that Asperger's was somewhere on the quote unquote autistic spectrum whatever the autistic spectrum is. So it's just a couple of things I want to just make clear. Are you telling this jury that the reason that you treated people the way you treated them in your life, meaning the lies, the violence, etc., are you saying that's because of your alleged Asperger's or being on the spectrum? Is that what you're telling this jury? You want me to know what I'm telling the jury? I want to know. You brought up Asperger's and you brought up autism. So I want to know, are you telling this jury that the reason that you treat people the way that you do, the reason you were violent and abusive to your wife, is somehow related to your alleged autism or Asperger's? Is that your testimony? I do not. I'm over it. Over I do not agree that I am all, that I am violent or a lying person. I am not blaming the way I am on anything. And it is you who asked me what a normal person would do if they decided a loved one was missing. So it is your position that allegedly because you have autism and Asperger's that rather than call Kathy's family to find out where she was, you immediately called the police. My question is, please explain to me how autism or Asperger's would in any way influence whether you called the police first or whether you would check with Kathy's family to find out if maybe she's with them. Please explain. If I was going to call someone it would probably have been one of Kathy's friends from Albert Einstein. Mr. Durst, wouldn't you have called her family before you called the police to find out if maybe they knew where she was? Isn't that what anybody would do? I don't know what anybody would do, but I thought that there was a real good chance that Kathy was causing Kathy not to go to Albert Einstein as part of her scheme to somehow or other redo an exam that she did badly on. And I was concerned that her family, that her family would not tell me where she was if they knew. Would you agree, Mr. Durst, that if you actually knew where Kathy was, such as, as an example, if she were dead, that you would not need to call her family members to check? 
Would you agree? I would agree. And if I knew Kathy was in a rocket ship, I would not have to call her family. By the way, I just want to be clear. That's not where you think she is. That's not a part of your defense. I just want to be clear that you're not now alleging that Kathy is in a rocket ship, maybe circling the Earth. I want to just clarify that's not what your position is. I don't think Kathy's in a rocket ship. All right, let's play the clip, please. Here, this is going to be from the March 15th interview, this 291, on the transcript 291A, page 76, lines 4 to 14. Yeah. We got another thing that I've got to say. Um, the, whole, the whole Asperger's thing. I am uh, so I'm trying to report that amount in any psychiatrist coming up with an explanation that it was never necessary at the trial. We don't need the psychiatrist. We thought you agree that was a load of bullshit by the by the shrink. Yeah. Mr. Durst, would you agree that the answer that you gave on March 15, 2015 is completely inconsistent and at odds? with what you've said in this courtroom today. I agree that the answer I gave was what I thought you wanted to hear so that we could do a plea bargain. All right, let's continue. Let's go to February 5th. You reported Kathy missing, and you would agree the first thing you did with Detective Strzok was to lie about the status of your marriage, correct? Is that correct? I don't know if that was the first thing I did. I told him the marriage had its ups and downs, that we had problems, but we were working on our problems, that we had had divorce lawyers for a year and a half, and that we, neither of us had ever filed for divorce. So you're saying you did not immediately lie to Detective Strzok about the status of your marriage and later admit to doing so? Is that your testimony? I think I was more or less brutally honest. And I told them we both had divorce lawyers. And I told them that the marriage had its ups and downs. RD072. 12, 13, 10, page 486, lines 3 through 10, please. This is from page, people 269, uh, 269A, page 71. Thank you. I went to the city uh, Friday morning, went to the office, went to the police precinct that afternoon, um, made a fuss about the missing person, medical school, rich person. And then they started investigating and how's the marriage doing? And I started out with not so bad. And then spoke to Joe Bird and Mary and found out oh, it's pretty terrible. Mr. Durst, you were acknowledging, correct, to Mr. Jarecki that you went in there, you were asked how the marriage was, you said, oh, it's pretty good. And then they talked to Gil Bird and they found out, oh, that's not true. That's what you just acknowledged, correct? In that clip. I think that's a very abbreviated statement as to how I felt. Between not so bad and pretty terrible. And you also added that the only problem was, quote, your wife's drinking. Is that correct? I probably did not want to say that the problem was her cocaine use. 
or you hadn't decided which BS version you were going to give yet, and that's the first thing that hit your mind, correct? Hmm. Why don't you rephrase it? You, Mr. Durst, isn't it true that as you're sitting there making up lies to the detective, that you hadn't decided at that point in time what your ultimate lie was going to be, and so you first focused on drinking rather than cocaine. Is that correct? Overruled? I knew on February 5th when I went to the precinct if I told them about her cocaine use or I felt that if I told them about her cocaine use it would discourage them from treating her as a missing person. So you thought you are the son of one of the wealthiest people in New York City. Your wife is a medical student. And you're afraid that if you mention her real issue, that the police are not going to investigate it. Is that your testimony, Mr. Durst? No, that is not my testimony. My testimony is when I called the precinct Thursday, late afternoon, and asked the lady, how do I go about reporting a missing person? And the lady said, who is missing? And I said, my wife, Kathy Durst. And the lady said, with a giggle, have you checked with your wife's boyfriend? And I said, she does not have a boyfriend. And then she said, have you checked with all of her, all her boyfriends? And she told me that a missing person is a very unusual kind of crime if it is actually a crime, because as many times as not, the person who is reported as being missing is desirous of being missing from the person who does the reporting. And as a result, the detectives are very hesitant to take on missing person cases. So, Mr. Durst, it's your testimony that a woman you had never met who doesn't know you is literally telling you on the phone without you ever saying your wife had a boyfriend that, in essence, your wife might be with her boyfriend and for you to call her other boyfriends even though you've never mentioned anything about your wife having boyfriends in the first place. That is your testimony of what somebody said to you from the police department over the phone? That is a testimony of what the lady who answered the phone at the precinct told me. And what went through my mind was that the lady has a sense of humor. What she did impress upon me that a lot of times the detectives do not want to take on a missing person. She, she was not the same person you allegedly called to report that you'd found Susan Berman's body, was she? Same lady or no? I never called anybody to report Susan Berman's body. Well, you said you picked up, you start, you dialed 911 and then you hung up, correct? Or did you forget that you said that? I did not forget that. I did take a, go to a pay phone and dial 911. And then I decided that I did not want to leave my name and I hung up. 
All right, Mr. Durth, let's talk about the blue light. When I refer to the blue light in the basement, do you know what I'm talking about? I know that Ruth Mayer said that on some day around when Kathy disappeared, she saw a blue light in my house. I also know that Ruth Mayer's husband, Bill Mayer, said that he never saw a blue light. So Mr. Durst, I'm going to play for you a clip from Ruth Mayer's testimony. I want you to tell me if this is inconsistent or consistent with your observations. This is going to be MR003. Uh, there were no lights on except for a blue light in the basement window. So it was odd. <laughs> so this home um, that we're looking at in Peoples 51 had a basement? Yes. How do you know that? I saw it. I was down there. You described for the jury um, just this basement. How do you get into the basement? There was a trap door, or you know, you pick up the floorboards in uh, the hall, sort of the hall living room area, and there was a staircase. And this was from within the house? Yes. Okay. And you had been down there before? Yes. Was this a large basement or a small basement? Well, the part that was open, I don't, you know, there may have been furnace or stuff that I didn't see, but right, right the immediate area where you could go was quite small. Okay. And is it an area that you could stand in? I think so. Okay. Um, were there any windows to the exterior of the home from the basement? Yes. I'm going to show you what's going to mark this people's 50 again. Can you see on this photograph? Yes. Where this window would be? It's on the uh, on the left, going towards the lake. Okay. So you see what I'm pointing yes. to right now? Yes. Is that the yes. area of the window? Yes. You want to circle circle out on people's fifty? Yes. You see what I circled? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Is that um, this area where you saw this light coming from? Yes. Had you ever seen a light coming out of the basement of their home of all the years you lived no. there before this? No. When you saw this light coming from the basement, were there any lights on in the house? No. How long was this light on? Is this a one night thing or? It was at least two nights. And then after those two nights, did the light stay on or did it go off? I think it went off. And did you ever see that blue light again? No. Mr. Durst, you've heard you heard that testimony when it was occurred live in the courtroom, correct? I heard it. I'm hoping you'll play her husband's testimony, which is completely different. Can can you explain, Mr. Durst? what that blue light was that Ruth Mayer testified that she saw for those two nights and only those two nights? I think it's her imagination. Would you agree, Mr. Durst? I want you to assume the following scenario, and this is going to be based on your admitted dismemberment of Morris Black. I want you to assume for a moment that you had killed Kathy Durst and that you needed to dismember her. Do you believe that you would have been able to do that between Sunday night and Tuesday. Overruled. Overruled. You want me to assume that I killed Kathy Durst, which I did not do. Would you have been able to dismember her between Sunday night and Tuesday? 
I would not have been able to dismember her ever. Well, Mr. Rich, how long did it take you to dismember Morris Black? Several hours. So I would assume then that if you killed her Sunday night, and let's assume that you bought tools on Monday at Chalmers, you would have had time to dismember her, correct, on Monday night and dump her body on Tuesday in New Jersey, correct? Timeline would have worked, right? Overruled. If I had killed Kathy, which I did not do, and if I had bought tools at Car Caldors, I would have had time to dismember Kathy Sunday night if I killed Kathy, which I did not do. And Mr. Durst, you've been aware of this allegation from Ruth Mayer for many, many years, is that correct? I am very cognizant of the fact that you are refusing to pray Ruth Mayer's husband's testimony because Bill Mayer's testimony totally contradicts Ruth Mayer's testimony. Do you mean the testimony where Bill, Ma where Bill Mayer said Bill that Bill Mayer saw no blue light. Bill Mayer also testified, Mr. Durst, that his wife told him at the time she saw the blue light that she had seen it, and he also said that he absolutely believed that she had made the observation. Do you recall that testimony, Mr. Durst, since you brought it up? Bill Mayer testified that Bill Mayer's wife said she saw a blue light. Bill Mayer also testified that he, Bill Mayer, saw no such light. That is correct, Mr. Durst. Let me ask him, are you aware of any reason why Ruth, Ma well, Ruth Mayer would have a reason or a motive to have made this up or to fabricate it? She's mistaken. So you, okay, so your belief is she's mistaken. Let me ask you something. Um, is it your position that there was never any blue light at all and not that there is an innocent explanation for the blue light? Do you understand? There's kind of two choices. One is there was never a blue light and she's lying or mistaken. Or two, there was a blue light and she actually saw it, but here's why that doesn't mean anything. Which is it that you're saying? There was no blue light. And she is mistaken. And Mr. Durst, if there had been a blue light, if her testimony is true, do you agree that would be highly incriminating for you? I don't know if it would be highly incriminating. I don't know what a blue light looks like. Well, Mr. Durst, would you agree that if in fact her testimony was correct, that a reasonable inference could be made that you were spending the time dismembering your wife's corpse in the basement. That would be a reasonable inference, correct? I know you're saying that's not true, but that would be a reasonable inference if, in fact, the blue light testimony was true, correct? The blue light testimony is not true, and Ruth's description of the basement of the South Salem home is also inaccurate. But, Mr. Durst, if it were true, there's no way on earth you would ever admit it was true, correct? There was no blue light. It's, uh, time Thank you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, do not converse among yourselves or with anyone else on any subject connected with this case. Do not form or express any opinion on the case. 1.30 p.m.